Uh, our next speaker is Inigo San Jose Vicier, uh, works as a software engineer at Google. Welcome. Uh, he will um, um, yeah, share the data flow streaming, uh, what's new and uh, what's coming. Yeah, welcome. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm Inigo San Jose. I'm a software engineer uh, in Google in the data flow streaming team. And I'm here to talk about data flow streaming. Um, I just wanted to tell you what are the things that we have been working on for the last months, years, name it, and we're working on now, just for you to know how data flow is improving, the streaming side, and you get an overview of what's happening. And before I get into the presentation, um, I was supposed to be here with my colleague Tom Sepp, who couldn't make it, unfortunately. Uh, just didn't want to take the whole credit for the presentation. In fact, this has been a teamwork. Uh, I needed help for, with some of the slides, with some of the projects. So maybe I should be taking credit of, I don't know, 7.3% of the presentation. I'd run the math, so uh, yeah. Anyhow, um, so yeah, I'm going to start with an overview of streaming at Google. Um, and then we will get actually to the projects that we've been doing, start with auto-tuning then some integration to Pubs app, uh, observability projects that we have been doing, and then something that I didn't know how to categorize, so I decided to call it other projects because it's very generic and it works. Uh, so yeah, the overview of data flow streaming, just before we get into the projects. I'm going to start a little bit with the history of streaming at Google, and then the difference between the two systems that we have in data flow today, streaming appliance and engine, and then uh, some basics of streaming because I don't want to get into the projects, and even though I'm not going to be super technical, I'm just going to be very high level, uh, I don't want to talk about key or key ranges if you don't know what keys and key ranges are. I don't think it makes sense for me to talk about those if you don't understand that. So, yeah. Um, so, history of streaming at Google. So, this is 2004. Google is just a search engine company, and they are trying to index the website. And they were doing this with a huge, huge, huge bad job. It was massive. And it was getting bigger and bigger. And there was a point that the job was failing pretty much all the time. And six months passed, and they didn't get any successful run. In fact, there were some uh, conspiracy, conspiracy theories about Google not indexing things on purpose because of x, y, and z. And the truth is that the job was failing. And they decided to fix that. Um, who knew, right? Um, they decided to hire these two people, Jeff Dean and Sanjay. Maybe they ring a bell. And their first task was to fix this um, bad job so it will succeed. And after some time, Jeff Dean sent this email to the whole company saying, hey, I came up with this idea that I'm calling MapReduce. It's amazing. Try it. Trust me, bro. And indeed, it was a great idea. And um, MapReduce is today the basics of distributed systems. I'm pretty sure that he didn't know at the time how big this was going to be, but it turned out to be very big. And as I was saying, uh, pretty much everything was bad there, and there were no real streaming systems. And the first that started appearing were focused on ads, so they were not general purpose as MapReduce was. It was things that were doing one thing and one thing just for, for, for ads. To give an example here, uh, Google wasn't as big as ads, in ads as is today. Yahoo, I think it was the number one. And they were trying to get more customers, of course. And one of the selling points that they had was, you run this ad campaign and you want to get metrics out of how the campaign is, is performing, right? If you were, went to the competition, you will get your metrics the next day. Uh, 9 a.m., you see how the previous day was going. You go to Google with these new streaming systems, you will get the data in 10 minutes, in 30 minutes, you name it. Which is a huge deal, right? It allows you to modify the campaign if you need to. Big deal. And it seems to have worked. Um, and yeah, as I said, this was specifically for, I don't know if I'm covering this, sorry. Uh, um, as I said, um, this was specifically for us, and it was not general purpose, like as MapReduce. So they decided, let's do something general purpose. and. Map is, uh, MapReduce is general purpose, so let's call it Map, uh, Streaming MapReduce. The thing is, Streaming MapReduce didn't um, take a lot of people. It, it, it was not a huge success, and eventually it was deprecated. 
uh, again, not many people was using it, so. And yeah, that was it. And then after some time, they say, let's actually build something that actually works and people want to use. And they came up with Millwheel. Uh, if you went to the founder's talk this morning, uh, Ruben was talking a bit of Millwheel. He was one of the people working on that. And Millwheel was the first to introduce the, f the terminology that we have today, um, like events, timings, timers, state, uh, yeah, the typical streaming things that we have today. But Millwheel was very low level. It was very hard to build things on top of, of Wimmill. So today, if we have, um, if we build a, a pipeline, we get the graph automatically without having to do anything. With Millwheel now, you had your computations that you needed to join by an edge, and you had to build everything yourself. You even have to uh, tell Wimmill and uh, Millwheel how to uh, process timing and, and events and so on. So it was very hard to, uh, actually build something, not as easy as it is, it is today, of course. Um, to, Millwheel was actually used by many um, projects inside Google. To give one example here, there was this project that was supposed to track anomalies in uh, search queries. And there's a fun anecdote um, about this project. They detected the death of Michael Jackson seven minutes before the actual reported death of Michael Jackson because, yeah, they detected anomaly in the um, search queries. Yeah, and I was saying, um, Millwheel, very low level, hard to build, but at the same time, Google, they had this Flume um, project that, again, if you went to the founder's talk, they talk about it, and it was um, something like MapReduce, but easier to the eye, easier to build, easier for the developers. You have nice APIs, the graph was built automatically without, without you having to join everything. And you have something that is very low level, hard to use, but it's streaming. You have something that it's easy to use, but it's not the streaming. Hopsh, you mess stuff together. And streaming flume. And streaming flume is still being used today. Um, a bit different. Now, uh, before streaming flume was built on top of Millwheel, uh, I will talk a bit on how it is today. Uh, but either way, streaming flume is still going now. Um, and at the time, there were talks about standardizing this Flume system, making, making it available to the public in cloud. And some people reach out to other important people and they say, maybe we should also standardize it in streaming, right? Maybe let's do something for streaming. And these very smart people like Ruben started working on this and it wasn't an easy task. Uh, Millwheel was pretty much built in, in, on top of internal things not very easy to actually externalize. But they got it, and they called it Windmill. And just as a reference, Streaming Flume now is built on top of Windmill instead of, of Millwheel. And yeah, that's the data flow that we know today. Uh, we've been making improvements in data flow. In fact, the whole talk today is about that. Uh, and one of the biggest improvements that we have had is um, the two systems that we have in data flow, Streaming Appliance and Streaming Engine. And I will talk to about those in a few seconds. Just want to get this slide here so you have a bit of technology of um, when the technologies came up. So yeah, a streaming engine versus appliance. So these are the two systems that we have in Dataflow. Um, a streaming appliance um, has one worker running in GCE and Cloud Engine. And the worker is divided in two. One part of the worker runs user code, so it runs the do functions. Your actual code is being run there. And one other part of the, of the worker runs Windmill. So it's in charge of Suffle, it's in charge of committing to persistence, it's in charge of exactly one guarantee, uh, in charge of timers, the typical streaming things. And when workers need to communicate through each other, they just do it, like they just communicate worker to worker. The new system, a streaming, apply, a streaming engine, um, divides this in two. We have user workers that, uh, as before, run user code but we, and run in GCE, and windmill workers that run in Google internal, and uh, they are only in charge of like this, the streaming things, shuffle, persistence, timers. And in case that workers need to communicate data between them, the windmill workers can talk between each other, and windmill workers can talk with uh, individual user workers. Um, just wanted to have these slides for a bit more clear. Again, user workers run the two functions, and Windmill commits to uh, persistence in case of appliance. 
the persistence is uh, persistent disks. And in case of um, a streaming engine, we have big table as persistence. So now that we, uh, oh, the benefits of streaming engine, of course. Um, so well, one of the most obvious benefits of using streaming engine is that, well, you have a more efficient user worker. If you don't have to divide the worker in two, it's going to be more efficient. Windmill worker is also going to be more efficient if it can run by its own. Um, now we don't need persistent disks. Uh, and this is very important because when we were upscaling before or downscaling, we needed to attach and detach this uh, persistent disk, which is a failing point. And it's not only a failing point, and it takes a long time. Um, it also it doesn't allow you to be as flexible as with a streaming engine, because you can only, since you are attaching that in this, you can only have a, a minimum workers versus your max. So I think it's a 15th of the max workers. So if you have a max of 150 workers, you can only downscale to 10. Don't quote me in this number, but I think it's 15. Um, Either way, so not only because of this persistent disk auto-scaling, um, attaching and touching, it makes it the auto-scaling to be more reactive and um, more responsive to, to the backlog, so we have better auto-scaling, and it also allows us to improve supportability and observability. The way that the Windmill Worker is built, you will get um, any update, you will get it just automatically with our rollouts, and um, you get more visibility of your pipeline because we can track metrics better. So now that we... So what do you have this uh, persistent disks? Big table. Yeah. Um, so the streaming big is again, I don't want to go super in, into details uh, with the projects, but just wanted to spend a little bit. And let's give us sample pipeline here, very simple. We have a pops up, pardu window, and then some shuffle with a group by key, another pardu, and then a sync. So this is a standard pipeline, and this is what you will see in the UI. But data flow doesn't see that. Data flow divides things into something that we call few stages. And the stages, what they do is they have a source, they have some user operations, and they have a sync. In this case, few stage one, the source is going to be pops up, uh, the user operations are going to be the pardu and the window, and the sync is going to be brought into shuffle from the group by key. Stage two is going to be greeting from shuffle, pardu, and brought into a sync. And now we know what the um, pipeline looks like internally. Let's see how a message uh, is translated internally. So every message is going to have one key assigned to it. These keys are not the same as the key values that you have in Beam. So there are internal keys that we assign regardless of the data type. And we use those keys to track um, if a batch is committed or not. So I have an example here. Um, we have Adbark, Apple, and Banana. And we don't use the element itself as a key. We has that value. Um, so as you can see, there's some random numbers there um, of the has of, of the element. And the reason that we have that has is because we are dividing the key space in, um, we, we need to divide the, the, the key space. And if we wouldn't hash it, if we have something as trying to write Google as a key, um, of course, most people is going to get it right. So most people is going to have more of the elements of the key are going to have Google, but the farther you are away from the actual word, the less elements it's going to be. If we divide this key space in, in sections, we're not going to get an even distribution. So we hash it so that we can get this even distribution of elements uh, when we divide the, um, the key space. It's important to know that the elements are processed in a context of a key. So if you have a batch of elements that have the same key and you get a new batch of elements with the same key, you have to wait for the first batch to finish, which translates to the keys being the basic unique of parallelism. If you have many keys, you can process many things at the same time. If you have very few keys, you don't have this, many, this much parallelism. To give an extreme example, if you have a single key, everything is sequential, you always have to wait for the, pre the previous batch to complete. So these keys belong to key ranges. Uh, key ranges are these divisions that I was, I was still telling about. Um, and to use again the same example as before, we have this key range here, every, uh, one key range per, per state, and this will be the maximum, uh, maximum range, so from zero to FF, we're using hexadecimal, and we can split those ranges. And the reason that we split those ranges is because we need to balance the load between workers. So the previous, step, the previous um, state was zero FF, now we divide it in two, so it's zero to A, A to F. 
And we again, we use these key ranges to um, balance the load. Have an example here. So we have the few, few stages from before that have these ranges assigned to them. Uh, and then we have our workers that get some of these ranges uh, and then now so that they can know which elements they have to process. So we have these elements, peer, banana, and steak, and we assign those elements according to the key. So peer will go to the worker one because it's zero to seven. Um, banana will go to worker one and the same with stick with worker two. Then we shuffle and we get another set of keys that goes to uh, the workers depending on which uh, range they had assigned. So finally, we understand more or less streaming. Let's get into the projects, which I guess is the reason that you're here. Uh, Auto tuning. These type of projects are in charge. Like, the idea of these projects is to make the pipeline react properly to changes. So if we change the throughput, if there's a particular key that suddenly gets more, more throughput, we want to react to those changes so that the pipeline performs properly. And the first um, project that I want to talk about is asymmetric auto scaling. I mentioned before, ah, by the way, all the projects that we um, are in this session only, only apply to streaming engine. They are not coming to streaming appliance. So another reason to use streaming engine. Um, yeah, asymmetric auto scaling. So I, I was mentioning that um, we have the division between user workers and windmill workers. And in the past, um, those two were tied to each other uh, with a ratio that was around two. So if you had 100 workers, you will get around 50 windmill workers. And in case that you have a pipeline that is very shuffle heavy, so it's very windmill workers heavy, uh, you will still need to have as many workers regardless of this amount of, of windmill workers, right? So if you have a pipeline that is um, group by key, stateful to function, another group by key, a reshuffle, you're going to have a lot of usage in the windmill workers. And as a consequence, you will have it also in the user workers. What we're doing now is we're decoupling these two so they can upscale and downscale independently. So as you can see on the bottom, there's two graphs. The left is the baseline. And when the um, windmill worker upscales or the user worker upscales, so does the, the other. So, and they go together throughout the life of the pipeline. In the, with the new feature, with auto asymmetric auto scaling, you can see that the pipeline decides to upscale. And after some time, um, it realizes that it doesn't need this many work, user workers. So you don't scale those workers, but you still keep the same amount of windmill workers. So there's a lot of savings in, in user workers in case of that your pipeline is um, shuffle heavy. Keeping with the auto scaling project, um, this project here is called key based throttling. And the idea here is that um, in the past, if you have a pipeline that was using less than 20% of, um, of the CPU, we wouldn't upscale, regardless of the backlog or, um, the, or, or, the, or the throughput that you had. Um, the reason of this decision is, in most cases, um, adding a worker wouldn't help, right? Because if you have 20% uh, of the CPU being used, that means that 80% is not being used. And why would I add a worker if he's not going to use the um, right amount of CPU, right? In reality, there are a few cases where this is not true. Um, let's say that you have an I.O. or you are fetching some data from an API or something. You need to wait for the response uh, of that API call or the I.O. And during that time, you're not using the user worker. So the, C the, the CPU is going to be um, not as high. So what we're doing now is we're detecting these scenarios where um, using keys. Um, and in case that we think that you're being throttled, we will upscale regardless of this CPU of 20%. Um, you have an example here. Uh, you can see that the pipeline was using five workers, but it was throttled by CPU. So even if you don't see it there, it was building backlog. And there's a moment that, for whatever reason, the CPU goes above 20%, so it needs to upscale. It detects that we have this backlog, we're above 20%, let's upscale. And it upscales to a very high value, which I think is 50. Um, so yeah, 50 workers, because we were building a lot of backlog. Now, with the new feature of uh, key-based throttling, you can see that the pile upscaled sooner, and the net, up net upscale decision is lower than before. So you are saving resources on, on that decision because you are not allowing the pipeline to build this amount of backlog. And of course, throughout the life of the pipeline, you will also have less backlog, which is something nice. The last project about auto-scaling, I swear, um, it's downscaling, uh, downscale dampening. And 
In the past, we were only considering the current state of the pipeline when uh, deciding to upscale or downscale. So we will measure the throughput, the backlog, the CPU, and make our decision. What we're doing now is decide, keeping track of the previous decision and use those to have a better uh, downscale. So the reason that we're doing this is because um, there might be this situation where um, you have a sudden increase in throughput, so you start building out of backlog and you need to upscale. You upscale to a big amount of, of workers, which then can get rid of the backlog very quickly. So you build a bit more backlog and then you upscale again, and then you downscale and then you upscale. So you jojo the amount of, of workers that you have and you keep doing that. And as a consequence of this, you are building a lot of backlog. Um, since now we are tracking the previous downscale decisions, we can tame those down and make the downscale more efficient and not let, letting, in, letting it uh, build this amount of backlog. I have a graph here to show um, how it performs. On the top you have the user workers, in the bottom you have the um, backlog bytes. Left is the feature not being used, and right is the feature being used. And as you can see, uh, the pipeline was upscaling and downscaling very frequently. And once we apply this feature, um, the, the amount of workers was more stable. It wasn't letting it build this amount of backlog. So again, this is great because you get a lot of latency and backlog. So we talk about upscaling and downscaling. Um, and we've made improvements on the efficiency of, of these decisions. Um, so every time that we upscale and downscale, we need to load the state of the pipeline, the, the state of what the workers were doing for, from persistent. Um, we use, do this because we need to keep track of which elements have been processed and um, just so, so that we can avoid duplicates, we can guarantee exactly ones. I have an example here. Let's say that this worker was getting the max range, so 0 to F, and then we decide to create a new worker. Now this worker has to read part of this range that the old worker had, and it needs to know what the other worker was doing and how far it, it went uh, throughout the backlog of the pipeline. So now it needs to load it from somewhere. In, we use persistence, so we use Bigtable. And the important thing here is we cannot start processing elements until the worker knows the state of the pipeline. So the time that it takes to load this, this pipeline state, there's not, nothing being processed, so there's more latency and there's more backlog being created there. So what we're doing now, instead of using Bigtable as um, the source of truth for, for this pipeline state, we're loading it directly from the, user, from the previous worker. So this allows us to load it faster, which implies less backlog and less latency. And I want to show, again, an example of with the feature enable and not. On the top, we have it disabled, bottom enable. And we're measuring here the um, delivery age. The delivery age is something that tracks the difference between the time that it takes between two workers to communicate with each other. And you can see the spikes of 2.25 minutes uh, when the upscaling decisions were happening. And with the feature enabled, we get spikes of 45 seconds at most. So a big improvement there in latency. And as a consequence, big improvement in backlog, which as a consequence, again, big improvement in user workers. As you can see here, um, the y-axis is not labeled properly, but um, on the top, it goes up to 50 workers. And in the bottom, it goes up to 20 workers. So there's a big improvement there because we're not letting the backlog being built throughout this time that we need to load the, um, the state of the pipeline. Uh, I've been talking about ranges, and one thing that we also have been improving is um, the load distribution between ranges. So there might be the situation that we have two keys that are very close to each other in the range, and they have a disproportionate amount of throughput. So as an example here, we have key one that has 500 megabytes per second, key two that has 300 megabytes per second, and key three that has 50 megabytes per second. Since the first two keys are relatively close to each other, they will go to worker one because it has the range zero to A. So it means that worker one gets 800 megabytes per second, worker two gets 50 megabytes per second. So pretty much worker two has been underutilized, which is a waste of resources. What we're doing now is we are measuring this um, discrepancy in workers in, in ranges load and splitting the ranges when we need to do so so that we can rebalance the amount of load. And in this case, as you can see, after we rebalance the load, we get the worker two 
that goes from 50 to 350, and the worker one that goes from 500 to um, from 800 to 500. So now we're utilizing the workers uh, better. Uh, you can see here um, how the feature w works in, in practice. Um, this rectangle over there is when we enabled this feature for that particular job. And both on the left and right is when it was not enabled. And we can see that the amount of workers, it's significantly higher when it's not applied to, when the feature is not applied to the job. Um, and when we, we have it there, the workers are more stable. We have used less workers, we use the resources better. And again, the reason of this is, since we have a better distribution of kids, we can use the workers more efficiently. And um, as an example of where this comes very uh, useful will be Kafka. Um, basically, with Kafka, you have um, a key per partition. So if the has happens to be close, if you have partitions which has are close to each other and they get more throughput, you might have the situation where um, you are overloading some workers and you will need more workers than um, without this feature. Um, and the last uh, project I want to talk about for auto-tuning is BigQuery auto-sharding. Auto-sharding, in case that you know, it's basically auto-parallelism, so it changes the amount of keys um, depending on the situation. And auto-sharding uh, was only available for two of the three um, methods that you, we have to write to BigQuery. So we have streaming inserts, we have uh, file loads, and the new API, which is called storage API, that allows exactly once uh, writing, which is great. So it was only available, available for the first two, for streaming inserts and file loads. And what is more important here is that this auto-sharding was based on the number of workers, not on the load itself. Um, so if you have 100 workers, you will get, I don't know, 1,000 keys. If you have 10 workers, you will get 10, 10, 100 keys, or 10, 10 keys, whatever I said. Um, and this can be a waste of resources, especially if we have dynamic destinations. Dynamic destinations is this way of writing to BigQuery that you point to a different table depending on the element. So there might be the situation again where you have table one getting 200 megabytes per second and table three only getting one megabyte per second. So because we depend on the amount of workers, they both get a thousand shards, which is not great. Now with the new auto sharding that we have for storage API, not only you get exactly one guarantee, you also get um, auto sharding based out of backlog and throughput. So in the case that we had before, instead of getting 1,000 workers, you get 800 and for table one, and for table three, you get four, uh, four shards, which is a better use of your resources. And you might be thinking, uh, why is it 800 shards for table one when before it was 1,000? And the reason is because if you have a pipeline that has a read, some, use, some heavy user operations, and then a, a write, that those user operations might lead to more need of work, the need of more workers. So it implies more shards with the previous auto sharding. Whereas with the new ones, if we track the throughput and the backlog, that wouldn't happen. So you're even saving in the situation of a single table in some cases. Um, again, some graphs to prove that what I'm saying is true. Um, I have three graphs here of three pipelines. The first one is using streaming inserts and anti-sharding. Second one, storage API as it is now. And the third one is with this new feature using auto-sharding. The pipeline is using a lot of workers, and this is because it was reading 10 gigabytes per second. So hopefully the 1,000 workers is justified. Um, and as you can see, the first one, streaming inserts with auto-sharding, is using the 1,000 workers, so it's using the max amount of workers. When we have storage API. Um, it's only using like 850, 900 on average. And with the new API and, and auto sharing, it goes to 400 workers. So it's a big, big difference here, big improvement on, on performance. And now pops up integration. This is the project that I was working on. Um, so as you might know, um, pops up in Dataflow is special. We have our own implementation of it that doesn't use the same as Beam. And the reason that we have our own implementation is because we want to use the internal PubSub client libraries because it allows us to keep track of the backlog and, uh, and the older SANAC in a better way, which makes Dataflow to perform better uh, in PubSub. So in the past, we were using this API called Unary. Basically, the way it works is the windmill worker will make a call 
to the PubSub uh, Unary pool API. It will get a batch of messages. Those messages, uh, messages will be sent to the user worker and process. What we're doing now with the new uh, streaming pool API is we're getting uh, we're creating a, an object called subscriber to the streaming pool uh, API, and then we're getting a stream of messages uh, to the women worker that then get passed to uh, the user worker. And this gives us a better throughput and latency. And to again show you that I'm not lying, this is data from the actual rollout. In blue, we have the pipelines that were used in Unary, and then they transition to streaming and in red. And as you can see, the watermark goes slightly lower Backload bytes goes lower. I think the average was 40 megabytes, 14 megabytes, and then 8 megabytes. So there's a big improvement there. And the biggest improvement here is with pull to arc. Pull to arc is a metric that measures the amount of time that it takes since you pull a message until you arc it. And we are keeping track here of the P90, so the 90 percentile of this time. And as you can see in the graph, it goes from 22 seconds in Unary to maybe five, four and a half in streaming. So it's a big, big improvement. And I wanted to show you um, how it translates in usage. Uh, and just to be clear here, this is a pipeline that only reads from PubSub and then does some user operations. It's very just solo, only to, to show PubSub uh, performance. And um, it's using it's reading one gigabyte per second. The reason that I chose one gigabyte per second is because we know the streaming pool gets better compared to Unity, the higher the throughput is. And as you can see, um, there's a big improvement. Both pipelines started with, I think it's 200 workers. And after some time, um, Unity decides that it needs to upscale, whereas streaming says like, hey, I can survive with less workers. And the same rationale comes uh, throughout the life of the pipeline. So there are big improvements in performance in, in those cases. And yeah. I have more graphs for this because, again, I was working on, on the swimming pool, and it's significantly better in most cases, uh, in pretty much all cases. Um, so now that we have the um, swimming pool project, let's talk about survivability. Um, this was a big focus for us because we want um, you to understand how the pipeline is performing. We want to make it easier for you to know if something is wrong, to detect it as, as soon as possible and as clear as possible. And yeah, this is a win for both you and us. Um, so yeah, we, it was a big focus. Um, again, all of these metrics are the same as the project only com come from for a streaming engine. And you have a huge table of the metrics that we have added recently. Um, you can see those in the monitoring UI. Uh, and the ones that are, are there, there are a few of those that we integrated directly with the Dataflow UI. So you have uh, easier access to, to those metrics just by going to your Dataflow graph. And yeah. And for those that are not in the Dataflow UI, we have created a um, dashboard template. So you can import the dashboard, and you will see some of these metrics directly. And it will be easier for you to um, try to your pipeline. And to talk a bit more about this um, graph that we have added, Again, streaming, on, streaming engine only. Um, processing, it's for me the most important metric that there is. This is literally the first graph that I take when I try to do a pipeline. It measures the time that it takes from stage to stage. So the, uh, the processing time between stages. So basically it's measuring the amount of user uh, time that it takes for, for an element to, to, to run. And in case that you see this growing linearly, in case that you see this, um, being relatively high, it means that there's something, pro there's probably something wrong with uh, with the user code, and you should check that. Um, parallelism, I guess you know what it is. It tells you the amount of keys that you have uh, per state, which is very important because we know few keys is bad, and you're limiting the amount of um, processing that you can have in, in your pipeline. Persistence, so it's the um, speed that we're reading and writing to to persistent disk, persistent one. Big table in this case, uh, duplicates. I guess you know what that is, and timers, which is the throughput and uh, amount of timers that the pipeline has in a in a given point. And as I said, for those metrics that um, are not in the Dataflow UI, we have this dashboard that you can import: uh, monitoring UI, dashboards, Dataflow, and Dataflow samplers. And that's our first view of the graphs. There's only four there, but I think in total there's twelve. Um, and I think they want to add more. I'm not sure about that, but 
yeah, you have a few uh, graphs that probably will make your life easier. Um, and you can filter by job, so yeah, that's great. And yeah, to conclude, uh, the projects that I didn't know how to categorize and other projects was fair enough. Um, the first one is called Out of the Box. So we wanted to see if we could get uh, 10 gigabytes per second um, of throughput with the common sinks and sources. And we wanted to get this throughput without any special setting. So we wanted to run it out of the box. And what I'm calling a special setting is, in case that you read to support every now and then, uh, you might have heard from us, hey, send this flag to your pipeline that is going to tweak some things internally so that your pipeline actually runs. We wanted um, to get this throughput without any special setting. So we wanted to, for you to be able to run this throughput without having to talk with us, which I think is important. And we did get this throughput uh, in Pubsa to BigQuery, Pubsa to Pubsa, Pubsa to GCS, Kafka to GCS, and Kafka to BigQuery. Um, so yeah, the most common sources and things. And the reason that there's an asterisk in GCS is because um, G with GCS you need to specify the number of shards, so this is something that you need to tweak. And uh, also GCS has a ramp up period that you need to take care, take care of. Um, and this is not data flow, this is the thing. Um, and I have an example of particularly pops up to GCS. And as you can see, we get the 10 gigabytes per second. So again, I wasn't lying. And there's this ramp up period that you can see. Um, and what is more important here, and what I want you to focus is that in the bottom graph there, um, they will have backlog estimate, which is the amount of time that Dataflow thinks that needs to get rid of the backlog and the current throughput uh, in terms of time. Uh, and it gets to 30 seconds, which is super low, considering that we have 10 gigabytes per second of throughput. So this is big, big, big improvement. Um, uh, yeah, the last thing I wanted to talk about, uh, I think some people in a, uh, Tobias talked about this in, in, in his talk. Um, a few weeks ago, we published this Dataflow cookbook that I was working on. And the cookbook, cookbook is a collection of, I think it's more than 190, maybe it's 191, I don't know, uh, self-contained Dataflow pipelines uh, that are pretty to you. So they're as minimal as possible. They do one thing and just one thing. And um, they use the most common sources, things, and uh, use cases. So um, yeah, and they're available in Python, in Java, and in Scala using CO. And the idea of this was to have a set of pipelines that you can copy and paste uh, depending on your use case. So for example, let's say that you have a pipeline, you want to build a pipeline that grids from pops up with attributes, then adds a session window, and then writes to GCS dynamically. So you can go to the cookbook, you go to the example of read with attributes, you copy the code, you go to the example with session windows, you copy the code, you go to the example uh, with dynamic destinations, to GCS, you copy the, the code, you mix the three together, and bam, bam, you have your pipeline with, with minimal changes. And um, yeah, hopefully that will make your life easier. Um, and it probably will also help you to understand some things in Beam in case you don't, uh, you don't know or you want to learn Apache Beam. The link is over there uh, Google Cloud Platform, GitHub, Dataflow, Cookbook. Um, so yeah, that was everything I had. Hopefully I didn't talk too fast. And now I'm very afraid of your questions. <laughs>